Hi, welcome back to True Story with John Gibson. Today's guest is IBB Pro entrepreneur, Chris Dim. Chris, thanks so much for joining me. Hey, you know what? Thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Completely my pleasure. pleasure. Excuse me. So you've been um, honestly a source of inspiration for me for many, many years. I, I, I was thinking this morning, um, kind of before this, this conversation, that uh, you know, we're spoiled in a lot of ways now because as like bodybuilding fans, if I want to know what someone ate for breakfast, it's kind of at the tip of my fingers through social media and everything. But people don't realize how big and important the magazine era was and your generation of, of bodybuilders and stuff. So I think it's really cool to kind of go back in time and talk about that. And it was a lot harder to follow the guys you, you, you liked back then. But I feel like uh, in some ways, because the information was harder to come by, you really felt more bonded to them, you know, um, at least I did, you know, and, and you're, you're one of those special people, man, because, you know, reading about you growing up, of course, I was so impressed with your bodybuilding career, but you, you had really overcome insurmountable odds before you ever touched a weight. And I think that's also a really important part of your story. I mean, growing up, you were a refugee from Cambodia, uh, you know, immigrated to the U S started, you know, you know, making that transition to a whole new country, new life. Um, do you mind sharing a little bit about kind of your younger years and, and what that was like? Yeah. Um, I can't see you though, John. The oh, I, I see you. I'm with you. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, growing up, I mean, I, I, you know, when I came down to United States, it was, it was rough. I mean, just, just before, you know, getting here was, was, was really rough, but, you know, having to, you know, pretty much cross the swamp, cross, you know, dead bodies. I mean, you, you name it, I've seen as a little kid, you know, and, and, uh, having to get to Thailand where, that's where the refugee camp was. And then my uncle sponsors and brought us to the United States. Um, but I still remember a lot of the stuff that happens as a kid, you know, it's like having to dig a, a hole because, you know, we didn't want to get shot at, you know, um, you know, pretty much starving. And uh, my mom had to basically work for the, pretty much the communist, the Khmer Rouge. Right. And, um, you know, she would still potato in in the middle of the night and cook it and put it in her mouth. And, you know, it was like, you know, she said, you guys are so good. You guys didn't make a peep. And then the next day they would line her up and says that, you know, uh, I know someone's been stealing potatoes. If I find out who it is, I'm going to cut their head off. Wow. So, you know, mom, you know, obviously because, you know, the, the kids are starving, she does what she needs to do to basically to feed us so to me when we came to united states it was like you know what i gotta make something of myself because you know uh mom struggled her whole life just to get us here to united states and um you know i gotta i gotta at least make something out of myself and um honestly mm -hmm. i didn't think i was gonna be a professional bodybuilder to be honest with you it was like i started you know doing it for wrestling in high school mm -hmm. because i was so scrawny Right. And, you know, a 98 pound wrestler my freshman <laughs> year. And it was like, you know what? I got to put some, some meat on that body. And um, results just started coming. And yeah. every single year I put on about five to seven pounds mm -hmm. every year, five to seven pounds. And, you know, I was a hard gainer. So it wasn't like it happened overnight when people right. see me later on, you know, as a pro and, you know, with all the muscle, it was like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, look at him, you know, but they didn't you know, a lot of time it's always like they don't see what you go through, you know, to get to where you need to get to. Right. Sure. sure. You know, it's I'm so glad you said that, too, because another reason I became an early fan of yours was because that was really how I found bodybuilding. I mean, I knew Arnold and, and those guys from television and movies, but I wrestled and I was a 112 pound wrestler. So I was a lot like you. I was a little guy and I started I found the weight room through that. And then I fell in love with it. You know, I fell in love with the way it felt and, 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 and the way my body reacted and stuff. Um, of course, I didn't have the genetics you did or anything to go on and I didn't take that pursuit, but I, I became a lifelong fan of it and and that was an important part of your story that i identified with really early but i also think it's really neat and correct me if i'm wrong but didn't it take like 16 years or something for you to turn pro yeah it took wow. me 16 years of uh 
you know, and I, I some of my clients that I, I tell them now, they, they, they just, and, and, and all, because it's like, <laughs> they're like, you know, I said in that 16 years, the most day I've ever taken off was either a Friday or I'm, I'm sorry, a Saturday or a Saturday and Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, one to two days over the weekend. That's, that's the most I've ever taken off uh, in 16 years of my career trying to get my pro card. So like a lot of people don't understand it's like consistency and persistency always, you know, gets you where you need to get to, but you know, how, you know, there's, there's a, there's a story of the, the marshmallow test. You ever, you ever heard of that? No, I haven't. Okay. So the marshmallow test, they, 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 they've taken these, these kids who's uh, about five, five, six, seven years old. And um, you know, at, at, I think, yeah, I think they're about four or five, somewhere around there. But anyway, so the marshmallow test pretty much, they take these kids and they ask them, say, you know, I can give you one marshmallow now. Or uh, if you wait an hour, I'll give you two marshmallows. And, and, and they re basically uh, connect with these kids, you know, uh, 20 years later. And what they found out is that the one that, 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 one at the that the one at the, the the one marshmallow right away they um they were never really basically they never stuck to anything long enough mm. and 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 the one that that waited for the two marshmallow they're the one that actually was able to stay consistent on something long enough to to basically become successful in whatever it is wow. so I, cool I found lesson. that pretty interesting you know it's like you know the same thing with with me and bodybuilding it's like I wasn't like a Phil Heath where, you know, four or five years and he's on the Mr. Olympia stage. Right. You know, I, I was those hard gainer that just took forever to get mm-hmm. there. But, you know, I wasn't going to quit because I knew that I believed what I was going to believe in. And, and like a lot of people, they're like, you know, I've never seen a, a, a an IPB Asian body, bodybuilder in my life. I've never mm-hmm. seen, you know, a, uh, a, uh, uh, a buff Asian bodybuilder. It just never happens. You know, why, yeah. why, why are you putting in a dream and something that's never going to happen? And, um, it, it was like, I didn't really care about what other people think. I knew that to me, okay, that's fine. But if I stay consistent, you know, hard enough, long enough, and I've worked my ass off to get to where I need to get to, I'm going to get there, you know? Right. Um, so, I'm not going to quit just because you think that, you know, you've never seen a, a Asian bodybuilder that's, 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 you know, big, right. but, you know, but I also knew that if I set the kind of like the pioneer for the Asian bodybuilders, I knew that I can, you know, if, if I did it, I knew that they can, they feel they can do it too. Yeah. And then right after me, you know, my, my friend, he, started, you know, yes. coming up and, and then now you see a lot of Asian bodybuilders, but mm-hmm. you know, it, it was like, you know, now everyone believes that they can do it, but right. from the beginning, no different than running the, the four minute mile, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. I thought it was, yeah, it's so true. And and you can, you know, and it's so, it's so interesting to be able to talk about this in, with the past, you know, with the perspective we have now, because while it took you 16 years to get there, when you hit, you hit. And you were, it, it felt like overnight. <laughs> and, and what I mean, it was this more, um, what's the word, more moritic rise? I can't say it, but it felt overnight in that you were on the cover of Flex Magazine. You had the Kristen DVD, you know, you were everywhere. You were, I think, top three or top 10 for sure, but at least in the Olympia three years in a row. I mean, you were there, you know, you were in the top echelon of the who's who's. And you did redefine body structure and all for an Asian bodybuilder. I had never seen, I think we as fans collectively never saw shoulders and arms like that. I mean, I, you were the inspiration of my tricep day for like two years, man. <laughs> like, it was crazy. <laughs> um, so then go, cool. So transitioning to there, you're at the top of your sport, you know, every, everybody knows who you are. You're, you know, you own businesses. I think max muscles at that time, you know, everything's yeah. going really well. And one day you're in the gym working out and all of a sudden chest pains. And then, you know, what happens? Yeah. So I, I was actually training my clients and mm-hmm. um, I was training my client. Next thing you know, I felt like I had a thousand pound on my chest mm-hmm. and um, I knew something major was going on. So I was able to slow my breathing down enough. 
and I had my 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 client call the ambulance and they picked me up and I was able to slow my breathing down, try to relax as much as I could because I knew something major. I couldn't get myself all worked up. Right. And, um, all I remember was waking up and, you know, staple chest and um, basically they cut me open and I had a they gave well before I even got up, they gave my family a that I was going to have a 10% chance to, to live. Like they weren't sure if I was going to wake up or if I was, I was going to wake up with brain damage and paralysis put together. Right. Right. And so um, miraculously I got up and um, walking to point A to point B, I was out of breath and I started training myself to walk and then start getting on the treadmill slowly. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I started running. Next thing you know, I started picking up the three pound weights, five pounds, seven pounds. Next thing you know, six months later, muscle memory came back and I gained everything back. Wow. And so that's when I decided, you know what? I don't want to end my career like that. I want to end it when I wanted to end it. Right. So that's when I came back and I decided to compete in another show. And when a lot of the guys that saw my name on the roster, they're like, what is Dim doing to himself? Yeah, I remember. Like, this was a big yeah, point of yeah. controversy. And that's, I was a supporter, but I, yeah, a lot of people were worried. Yeah, yeah. So then when I got on stage, it was like, oh, damn, Dim looks good. He looked awesome. Yeah, yeah he looked awesome. Yeah, and then, you know, took top three again, qualified for the third Mr. Olympia. But right after that, um, I did the Olympia, then I did the Sacramento Pro, but there wasn't any like 212 or anything. It was just an open show. So I did that and I took fourth. And then that's when I said, you know what? I'm going to retire. Yeah. So that's when I chose to retire. And then um, right after that, they took a CT scan, found it. The the second part of my order was starting to expand. They're like, hey, look, we need, a, we need to do another surgery on you. If not, what's going to happen is you're going to basically – you can, you, you can die. Yeah. So I said, you know what, let's, let's do it. So then I came back and then they cracked my chest again, uh, for the second time, did the second part of my aorta fixed that. And, um, and then 2010, they said, you know what, uh, the bottom part of your aorta is starting to expand too. We need to fix that also. Mm-hmm. So then the second doctor who did the second surgery, you know, told me, hey, when you go back to Kaiser, make sure they they don't do the stents. Uh, Make sure they do the full cut. Mm -hmm. If not, it's not going to hold up. Mm. And uh, I let I let Kaiser talk me into doing the stents. And next thing you know, 2012, I started sweating, started having chest pain again. I said, man, I know this something major is going to happen if right. I don't get into it. So I rushed myself. I drove myself to Kaiser and I sat there in the parking lot and goes, you know what? I know they don't have a good cardiologist. If I go in, I'm going to die. Mm. So then I drove myself to the second hospital who did the, the second surgery. Mm-hmm. And um, I went in, my blood pressure was 240 over 180. Oh my gosh. They rushed me in hypertension and um, they took me in right away. And what happened was the, 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 the blood flow was going around the stent instead of through the stents. Oh my gosh. So the blood was just like seeping, you know, seeping out. Mm-hmm. So they did an emergency cut. That's when they cut me from the back of my shoulder blade through my rib cage to the front of my stomach and opened me up. And then took the stent out, fixed me the right way. And then they had me in an ice suit for like two days. And I couldn't, I I couldn't understand why. And I was freezing, I was freezing cold. And finally after the second day, I said, please, please take this, this, this suit off me. I'm, I'm, I'm cold. I'm freezing. And then they took it off. And then the doctor came back in and he looked like he was in tears. And, uh, he said, um, Chris, there's a chance you'll never walk again. You have a spinal cord injury. And then that's when I, I like touched my legs and I couldn't feel my legs. Mm. Uh, I couldn't move my toes. Mm -hmm. I tried to get up and I fell off. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's when I, I, I I just, I couldn't believe it. I was like, man, this is gotta be a, 
and I was still kind of drug up. So I'm like, this is this is this is just a dream. This is this this right. it's not real. I, you know, and then when reality sank in, you know, and I I I just thanked the 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 doctor and I said, you know what, doctor, I said, you know, um you saved my life. Hmm. And um if the legs is something I have to deal with, I said, I'm gonna walk again. I said, don't I'm not, I'm not, hmm. you know what, I'm not really concerned with it. And um that's when I took my journey Mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah, it's such a testament to your resiliency. And, and, and earlier we talked about how persistent you were, but maybe that's not the right word. I think you're resilient, you know? And I mean, it's amazing because you had already had to teach us. You've already had to teach yourself to rewalk before that final uh, spinal cord injury too. So it's like the amount of adversary you had already overcome. It's just, a, it's more than most people will ever see in their whole lives. And, um, and again, the reason I, I started the interview I, very intentionally, I said, you've inspired me for years because it's true. And I'm going to give you a real life example. And I saved it for the show instead of texting it to you. But um, I had my neck recently fused about uh, probably about three months ago now. And post-op, I was in the room alone and coming to out of surgery. And, and because of COVID, my wife was in the parking lot before they let her in. And the first thing I did when I came to Chris was I went to one of your videos on YouTube and you were talking about your injury and you're so uh, positive and, you know, and you've still lived this life since where you're, it hasn't slowed you down. You're driving cars, you know, you're, you're in the gym, you're active, you still train clients. And that's exactly what I needed in that moment. I was feeling sorry for myself. I was feeling sad. But um, again, man, I was 15 years old looking at a magazine thinking, oh, Chris Dim's triceps. And then oh, years, years later, you know, you were a whole different source of inspiration for me. And, and I just think that I wanted to tell you, you know, and I want you to know, man, that your, your suffering is not for naught because I'm so sure there's other people like me that have been out there that have gone to YouTube and needed that, you know. So I just I so appreciate you sharing the story. Um, yeah, we're always going to have challenges no matter what, you know, and it's like, um, you know, when I decided to come back and in 2019 and decided to do a wheelchair competition, mm-hmm. you the know, wheelchair it, Olympia, is that what that was? Wheelchair Arno and the wheelchair Olympia. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when I came back, it was, it was more, it's been 10 years since I competed. And again, remember I retired. Mm-hmm. And uh, the only reason why I came back was to challenge myself to, to say, you know what, I'm in a wheelchair, but I, I'm, I'm going to challenge myself and let other people know that I can do it again, even in a wheelchair. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I came back and and first year out, you know, took second at the Arno and mm-hmm. third at the wheelchair, Mr. Olympia. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it wasn't like I wanted to keep competing. I did it just to challenge myself yeah. to, to, to tell myself, you know what, because it, 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 I can, I will tell you this it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole entire life. Because when you have no core and you have no legs to like really push down on it yeah. or being able to get to these, in, get into these machines, mm-hmm. um, it's hard, man. It's, yes. it's yeah. super hard. And, and, you know, if it wasn't for my, my girl helping me with, um, you know, re-racking the weights and, mm-hmm. and bonding me and stuff like that. I, I wouldn't be able to do it, but you know, mm-hmm. um, that I will say that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole entire life coming back and, and competing. But, yeah. you know, uh, if you ever see the transformation picture and I did in, 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 in basically a year, I went from this, you know, fat person, um, <laughs> to, to, you know, getting on stage shredded mm-hmm. in, as, in the wheelchair. So it's like, you know, I think we all have challenges that comes in and it's like, you know, people, people only see that, oh, Chris is in a chair, but they don't understand. Like, you know, I got to use a freaking catheter every three, four hours, to stick this freaking long thing, you know, right. down my penis. You know, I got a, I got nerve pain 24 hours a day because from being cut and it's like the nerve never healed up. So it's like, it's like taking stun gun and sandpaper when it touches my shirt, you know, oh, man. and yeah. so I got to deal with that 24 seven. And um, it, it's like, there's, there's, there's always obstacle that comes and it's like, it, it never ends. But mm-hmm. at the same time, it's like, you know, you got two choices. 
is you either have to have a good attitude about it and move on or basically have a shitty attitude and feel bad so right you know. exactly right and one thing that, yeah exactly and you've chosen the right attitude and you've kept pressing forward i mean you know and with that i mean you definitely have a gift to like encourage others and you have clients are you still training full-time i know you you did own a gym right do you still own a gym no i sold it i sold it to enhance athlete in uh, um back uh, a couple of years back and um and then I ran a fit body boot camp for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And uh, with, with my girl, we, we, we did that for a while, but then, you know, I'm looking at myself going, man, I'm getting up at five 30 in the morning, you know, teaching classes and stuff like that. I'm like, man, I'm burning myself out. So yeah. then we did, we sold out. And then um, we, now we just do a uh, person. I have a, 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 a full gym set up at my house. So oh, then, cool what I do is I just uh, train clients here and then now we're getting into cold scoping and, you know, with the shedding body fats away and, mm-hmm. you know, um, teeth whitening and okay. red light therapy. And so, you know, we're always doing something, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah. I, I don't sit there and go, you know what, boohoo me, you know what I mean? Sure. Do you coach competitors? Do you do any online coaching or kind of consulting? Yeah, I do that also. Yeah. I mean, you'd be such a well, like such a resource. If I had a show, I mean, I would definitely try to link up with someone like you for sure. Um, that's been there, especially another hard gainer, because I, I feel like your perspective is going to be probably unique to more of the average guy, you know? Yeah. You know, the new generation of kids, man, you, you gotta, you gotta really, really like get their mind right because they don't, they don't train hard. You know, most of them anyway, Mm-hmm. like we did back in the day and it's like um they you know they rely on the, the drugs versus like the hard work and mm-hmm. i try to implement the opposite of like relying on the hard work and you know more mm-hmm. and so um it is know, a different mentality i feel like 80s 90s at least growing like my whole generation growing up and i really do believe the generation before me more so you you know like we would punish ourselves working out It was like annihilation. It was overtraining. It was volume and heavy. It was like, how much further can I go this week? You know, and it was fun, (laughs) but, uh, but you know, we paid for it probably later in life with injuries and stuff. But yeah, nowadays I noticed it's a lot of like, yeah, pump stuff, a lot of machines and and yeah, it's definitely a different, different atmosphere for sure. Training. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, like I said, I, I I keep myself super, super busy. Uh, I, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, my book's done. I'm just uh, looking for somebody to finish publishing and putting oh, it together. Right. So um, that there's a lot of stuff in there that, you know, basically will, will tell the story of pretty sure. much everything, you know. A little bit more in depth, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Depth. So where do you, uh, and, and, you know, I know we're coming a little bit on time, but where do you recommend, what's the best place, I guess, for people to follow you if they want to reach out about the book, again, training, just encouraging, um, anything? They, they can reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook. It's just, okay. you know, Chris Dim, I, be pro, Perfect. Uh, you know, and, and they can, they can, they can message me and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good about getting back to people. Okay, great. All right. And I actually have one last thing I wanted to do here. Um, no pressure, but it's a little kind of a word association game I play. Um, I've done it with a couple of guests before, but basically I was, I'll name just a couple bodybuilders. And can you just in a sentence or two, just sort of say what the first thing kind of springs to your mind? We'll start off with, uh, let's see, we'll go, we'll go easy. We'll go Milos Sarchez. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> you guys train, he was your trainer, right? Yeah, he's, 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 he's what you call a Nazi trainer. I mean, he will, he has no filter. Milos, I love Milos, you know, he's my coach, but yes, no filter whatsoever. The mind, right? (laughs) I love it. So um, how about uh, Flex Wheeler? Another guy, you know, a tremendous athlete and a lot of health adversity, right? Yeah. I mean, I I say genetics. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Chris Cormier or Cormier, Cormier. Yeah. I would say um, with him, it's, uh, I, I would say legs. That's yeah. just one. Uh, but if you look at his inner sweep, I mean, not a lot of people's got that thick inner sweep. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. All right. I got one for you. Uh, Lee Priest. I mean, you guys, I feel like we're so similar. Lee, freak of nature. Freak. <laughs> freak, right? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Okay. And then uh, how about uh, David? Um, is it Long? He was another kind of two, 212. Oh, David Henry? Henry. Henry. Thank you. Yeah. Another guy. Yeah. Um, I, I would say Giant Killer. Giant Killer. Yeah, that was right. He had the best nickname. That's right. Man, I love those guys. You were part of such a special, special crop of bodybuilders. Um, kind of last question here. Is there any sort of fond memory or special memory from competing that you like to kind of reflect on? Any part of your kind of career backstage, anything like that? Or a win, just something special? Yeah, just, you know what? It, 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 it's um, the memory is always going to be there. And that's basically, you know, um, the fans and, 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 and just, you know, the love that I get from the sport. I mean, to me that that's, that's priceless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful, man. Chris, thank you again so much for joining me. Um, this is such a pleasure to get to know you a little bit better. And, and again, thank you for sharing so much of your story. Um, again, this is true story with John Gibson. Today's guest is Chris Dim. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris.